You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. This is the Option Industry Council's Wide World of Options. Before we start today's show, investors should know that options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. You should not enter into an options transaction until you have read and understood the risk disclosure document, characteristics and risks of standardized options. This brochure is available by visiting optionseducation.org or by calling 1-888-OPTIONS. OIC makes no recommendation with respect to any financial firm. OIC does not make any warranty as to the the accuracy, usefulness, timeliness, or the continued availability or existence of information created or maintained by others. Multiple leg strategies involve multiple commission charges. Opinions and strategies expressed by others are not necessarily those of OIC, nor does OIC endorse, warrant, or guarantee products, services, or information described or offered by such firms. Commissions, fees, margins, interest, and taxes have not been included in any of the examples used in this show. These costs impact the outcome of all stock and options transactions. Consult your tax advisor about any potential consequences. None of the information presented in this show should be construed as a recommendation to buy or sell security or to provide investment advice. Welcome to the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. OIC was created in 1992 to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. And the Wide World of Options radio show is one of the ways the message is spread. OIC also offers a variety of other resources to those interested in learning more about options, including webinars, podcasts, and live events. For more information, check out optionseducation.org. Now, here's your host, OIC's Director of Individual Investor Education, Joe Burgoyne. Welcome to OIC's Why World of Options. Thanks for joining us for today's show. Let's get started first with Strategy Spotlight. It's time to break down the latest option strategies. That means it's time for Strategy Spotlight. Joining us today on Strategy Spotlight is my colleague, Ed Modla, manager of OCC's Investor Services. Welcome, Ed. Thanks for having me, Joe. Good to be here. Uh, thanks for making the time. As, as we get started, how about if uh, you want to tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and your responsibilities at OCC? Sure, Joe. Um, as you said, I manage the Investor Services team at the Options Clearing Corporation. And uh, basically, we provide support for any product that OCC clears. On a daily basis, me and my team are working with exchanges and trading firms and data vendors, uh, lending support, whether it be from an educational or technical uh, perspective, on anything OCC clears, mostly equity and index options, but also single stock futures uh, and some other products as well. That's got to keep you busy. <laughs> Absolutely, Joe, but we love it. Indeed. Uh, well, let's, uh, you know, we're talking strategy spotlight here. So uh, I know you wanted to talk about the iron butterfly. Um, how about if we start by having you define what is an iron butterfly? Yes, it's one of my favorite strategies to, uh, to teach about. Uh, it's a fairly complex strategy. It has four pieces, and there's different ways to look at it. We'll just start by breaking them apart. Um, first of all, the investor is looking to generate income. This is a credit strategy where the investor sells a call and a put option at the same strike, then goes up higher in strike to buy a call option, and then lower in strike an equidistant amount to buy a put option. Uh, so if you followed that, there's a few different ways to look at it. This could be considered a short straddle and a long strangle, or you can look at it as two credit spreads as well, vertical credit spreads, I mean, uh, selling a bear call spread and selling a bull put spread. If you look at it that way, the stipulation is that you're selling the same strike. So looking to generate some income, you're selling options, and then you're buying cheaper options outside of that to protect the risk that selling options uh, entails. So the iron butterfly is always a credit trade? 
That's right, Joe. So you're going to be selling the more expensive option between the two calls. And similarly, uh, when you look at the, the put side, you're selling the more expensive put. So you will always be receiving a credit when you execute the Iron Butterfly. Okay. So I think our more advanced listeners will know the answer to this question, but you know there are probably many who do not. Talk to me about whether the Iron Butterfly has defined risk or open risk. Right. Very important to understand that because when you sell options, there certainly is a lot of risk in either direction. As constructed, there is defined risk. For the one call option you've sold, you've purchased one at a higher strike to protect the upside risk. On the downside, you've sold a put option. There's a lot of risk when you sell a put option, but you've also purchased one at a lower strike price to protect that risk. And I'll just stipulate as well here, that risk is defined as the trade is constructed and while it exists prior to expiration. We may get into this a little further here in a minute or two, but uh, at expiration, if there's exercise or assignment activity and it results in a stock position, that changes things significantly. But as it's constructed with the options in place, it does have defined risk. Good. Um, I'm going to come back to the time frame of things. How about, you know, you're talking about a couple credit spreads. What about the distance between the strikes? Is there an optimal difference? You know, I, I get this question a lot talking about this strategy. And, um, you know, I, I don't uh, convey the message that there is an optimal distance, that instead the investor needs to evaluate their confidence level in their market outlook. We're selling spreads here. We're looking for a neutral market environment or consolidating market, uh, your confidence level in that market outlook is going to lead you to a level of risk tolerance. And once you know what that is, you can then decide how far wide do I want to go in strikes, meaning how far out do I want to go to buy the call or buy the put. The wider you go, the further out you go, the less you'll have to pay for those protective long options and the more risk you'll take from one trade to the next, if you have more confidence in your market outlook, you might be willing to do that with a little bit less confidence or a little more uncertainty. You may want to pay up for more protection and decrease the strike width. So optimal distance, I wouldn't say there is. Uh, that would change from one uh, market condition to the next. Uh, but your confidence level in the trade and your risk tolerance will lead you to the width or the distance that is most appropriate for that trade. All right. Um, good explanation. Now, you know, this, you know, let, let's, you're, you're talking about kind of the, the movement and the underlying, you, you want to go through maybe an example with a couple different strikes in terms of, you know, what movement we're actually looking for in the underlying yeah. in the iron butterfly. Yeah. So in general, we're looking for little to no movement, ideally no movement at all. So when I said this is a combination of a, different, a few different strategies, if we sold the uh, straddle at, say, the strike price of 50, so we're selling a 50 call and a 50 put, and then we're going up in strike, buying a 60 call, going lower in strike and buying a 50 put, and we're going to receive a credit for all four, and we receive a credit, ideally, we want all of the options to expire worthless. We want this whole package of options to be worth nothing at expiration. The only way that will happen, in my example, is if the stock stays right at 50, exactly at that price. Then both spreads or both sides will have no value, and we receive our full credit, and that would be our profit. Now, it's highly unlikely that the stock will be exactly at the strike price. It's more than likely going to be uh, one direction or the other, meaning either the call or the put we sold will have some value to it. So we'll have to evaluate that and then decide if we need to take action. If there's just a little bit of movement, we're going to be in a good position. Uh, but as I said earlier, we'll have to also manage this trade if we don't want a resulting stock position, which changes the risk profile, then we'll just have to go in and take action and buy back one or both of those short options. Not too complicated, just something you have to know that this position is most likely going to require position management. Well, along those lines, it, you know, do you think there's a best time to actually put these positions on and then take them off as related to you know, expiration? Right. Well, we're looking for time decay. So we're, we're selling options here. 
Um, it's generally understood that the rate of time decay starts to increase right around that 40 day until expiration time frame. So that could be a starting point. Of course, we know that uh, time decay accelerates as you move towards expiration all the way through expiration day. So you can use that as a starting point, but certainly selling shorter term options could be viable using this strategy. Uh, closing out the position um, is something you'll be monitoring. As the trade works in your favor, hopefully, um, you'll be tracking how much left in this trade is there to make and how much time is there left before expiration and evaluating that on a daily basis. At some point, you may decide there just isn't enough value left to be made on this trade to make it worthwhile to be held. And that mean, that would lead you to possibly buying back those options, closing out the position, and moving on. Uh, to push that to a little bit further extreme example, you might be sitting there a day or two until expiration with almost no value left in the iron butterfly, meaning the stock has stayed right at your strike price. If you hold that for a couple more days and there's a big move, you could stand to lose a lot when you have very little left to gain. So closing out the position is something you might look to do if the value has shrunk significantly and you're closing in on expiration day. Okay. Um, so the target for the stock uh, as you after you initiate the position is for it to hang around that short strike. And then the worst case scenario is for the stock to move either the upside or downside to that long strike, correct? Yeah, to that long strike or beyond. So we know the stock can't be in, in two places at once. It can either move to the upside or to the downside. If it goes to or through the long strikes, as you mentioned, Joe, that's where we reach our, our maximum loss. And that can be easily calculated when you're evaluating this strategy. The distance between the strikes, the strike we sold and the strike we bought, uh, is how much we might have to give back at expiration, worst case scenario. So the loss would then be that amount or that width between the strikes minus the credit we received up front. Or as I explain it, uh, usually in the reverse order, we were paid up front a certain amount of credit in the worst case scenario, we have to give back the distance between the strikes and the difference between those two dollar amounts is a potential loss for us. You can calculate that right up front. We said that earlier, it's defined risk. And then you can evaluate your risk reward profile from there. Dynamite, always, um, at least for me personally, I always like those strategies where we do have defined risk. One last thing, um, maybe a little bit of a curveball. You know, we get so many crazy names in the options business you know, with strategies. We've got uh, right. the iron butterfly we're talking about. There's also the iron condor. Probably a lot of our listeners are familiar with both. Can you just maybe briefly describe the difference between the iron butterfly and the iron condor? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I'm glad you brought it up because there's a lot of similarities here. And you're right, the iron condor has a lot more popularity to it. A lot of listeners may trade iron condors, but might not be as familiar with the iron butterfly. Their construction is very similar in the sense that you're selling a more expensive call option and buying a cheaper one for protection, and then on the other side, selling an expensive put option compared to the put option you're buying. All of that's the same. The only difference with the iron butterfly is the strike that you've sold is the same for the call and the put. The rest of the profit and loss graph looks the same. So from a risk perspective, the Iron Butterfly will receive more premium. You're selling two options at the same strike. They're going to be closer together, likely at the money strike. So you'll receive more up front, and it's very likely that you're going to be taking on more risk. So if anyone's trading Iron Condors, if there is a situation where they are extremely confident that the move in the underlying will be very small in nature or a consolidating move, the Iron Butterfly could be an option because you are increasing your potential return along with it, increasing your potential loss or risk, but that might be a decision you're willing to make and willing to take on because your market outlook is more confident. And so the Iron Condor, uh, of course, is a great trade and certainly has defined risk, but usually in comparison to the Iron Butterfly, your credit will be lower and your potential loss will also be lower. Nothing wrong with that. Um, but in those situations, as I said, where your confidence is higher, you may will be willing to take on more risk. And I'll just repeat, with the Iron Butterfly, it's very likely that you'll have position management to do. With the Iron Condor, what you're hoping for is 
the stock stays in between your short strikes and you don't have to do anything at expiration. And believe me, I've talked to plenty of investors that try to select short strikes that the stock will not get to. So they don't have to take any position management. They let their options expire worthless and move on to the next trade. Keep in mind with the butterfly, it's very unlikely that both of your options are going to expire worthless. One of them uh, the short options I'm referring to, one of them is likely going to be in the money and might require some action on your part to avoid a stock position. I'm glad I asked. Great, uh, clear description. Thanks, Ed. How, um, yeah. how do investors reach you or your colleagues, Bill and Mark, uh, at the OCC if they have option-related questions? So uh, a couple ways. We are at our desks on trading days, um, 8, or 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Central. Uh, we respond to emails um, every single business day, and that's uh, options at theocc.com. We also have a live chat uh, during the morning and afternoon hours where investors can reach us live. And you can find both of those pieces of contact information at the OIC's homepage, so optionseducation.org. On our homepage near the top, you will see a contact investor services link, and that will take you to references to both our email and chat functions. And we welcome all questions. That's what we're here for. We love doing it. So we'd like to hear from all your listeners. Fantastic, Ed. Um, you know, great way to wrap it up. Any other closing thoughts? Well, I'll just I'll just reiterate, Joe, this is a credit strategy. And so the Iron Butterfly with these different moving pieces does require some management. Like I talk about with a lot of investors when I speak with them, when you're trading options, especially the more complex strategies, you are monitoring your account actively and you have a game plan. You know what you're going to do if the underlying makes certain moves. So with this strategy and many others, for, forecast what the underlying might do that works for you and also be prepared for what might work against you and how you'll take action. That's always a good uh, a process to take on and a good habit to get into. Look ahead and take the appropriate action and don't be surprised. Fantastic. Yeah, well, again, uh you know, it's great to have you offer such a clear explanation for both the Iron Butterfly and Iron Condor. We appreciate you joining us on today's Strategy Spotlight. Have a great rest of the day. Yeah, my pleasure, Joe. Thanks for having me. Now, let's meet the movers and shakers from the world of options in profiles and perspectives. Joining us today on Profiles and Perspectives is the new Vice President of Education at the Options Industry Council, Paul Finnegan. Welcome, Paul. Well, thank you, Joe. It's uh, you know, great to have you as uh, the leading member of our team. Um, you know, How about if we get started by talking to our listeners a little bit about maybe uh, your experiences and journey through the financial industry prior to joining OCC? Well, Joe, I'm not exactly sure if our listeners are going to find my background very interesting, but um, I certainly have enjoyed very much, you know, participating in financial services and the financial services specifically in options um, over the last 20 years. So I'm definitely aging myself with that statement. Um, you know, I've worked for a variety of firms under a variety of scenarios, and um, I've, I feel very fortunate that I started my career in the options industry. You know, when I look back, there were two situations um, that probably impacted the direction that I took in regards to pursuing a career in financial services. And Joe, please stop me at any moment if you feel that this is going way off the um, way off the spectrum, or if you think it would be interesting, in, interesting, you know, to our listeners. But um, when I was in grade school, I, I I used to cut my neighbor's lawn, and um, at Christmas time, he gave me an envelope, and you know I was expecting my normal, you know, twenty dollar Christmas bonus for shoveling his snow and cutting his lawn. Well, there was a stock certificate in that envelope, nice. and um, uh, very nice, very nice. But I had no idea what the heck it was. Um, you know, I was sort of disappointed at first, and it was for a company called MCI, and they had been suing AT and T. And um, this goes way back. I mean, it's, you know, it, it, like I said, I was in grade school at the time. But um, interestingly enough, um, he asked me um, a number of months or into the summer months, he says, Paul, you know, are you, have you looked at the five shares of MCI that I gave you? And I, had, I said, no. He showed me how to read 
um, you know, the stock tables in the Wall Street Journal. And I quickly learned, Joe, that it would be far simpler and far easier um, to make money in financial services than it would be for cutting lawns in the summer <laughs> and shoveling snow in the winter. Well, you you're know, a quick and, study. Yeah, well, I, I was fortunate enough to have a kind neighbor at that time um, as well. And then the second thing that really impacted my, you know, my decision or to sort of, um, I, I guess, where I started off at was um, I was employed at the CBOE, and they had introduced a new program, a new product called Leaps. And um, I got heavily involved in that in that program, and, you know, it was sort of off to the races at that point. So that's just a brief background. Um, you know, I'm probably one of the few people, Joe, that you'll have on the line that can um, – you know, make the statement that, um, you know, I've, I've worked for five years at the NYSC, five years at the CBOE, and five years at the Chicago Board of Trade, and I'm very, very fortunate to join, you know, the team that we have, including yourself here at the um, OIC. Well, um, you know, we're just uh, very excited to have you join, Paul. A couple great stories there. Love the history. Um, what What is it? that really, um, I guess, brought you to the OCCOIC? Why, why did you want to join us? Well, you're asking some pretty tough questions. I feel like I'm going through the interview process again. <laughs> um, I, you know, I feel like I've come full circle, Joe, in my career. You know, um, you know as, I, as I mentioned earlier a little bit, I, you know, I was significantly involved, like, you know, in, you know, the business development initiatives and broker training with that um, original Leaps product that was launched. And if anyone on, you know, if any of your listeners, just for simplicity and clarity, Leaps is long-term equity anticipation securities. And um, the CBOE launched that product, as I had mentioned. But it was well understood, you know, that an exchange could do all of the marketing that it wanted to do on new product launches. Um, but, you know, the exchanges, even to this day, they don't own the distribution network. You know, the broker-dealers and the investment advisors and, and so forth really are the ones that own the distribution network to the end user. So I spent a lot of time visiting branch offices and performing broker training in regards to options and specifically in regards to leaps. Um, you know, and I, this is, I'm, I'm definitely going to answer your question, Joe. It's just a long-winded one long-winded answer for you, but some of the larger wirehouses were very, very cautious about allowing exchange staff members to promote options. Um, but the LEAPS product provided, you know, sort of an, 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 an opening of the door of a lot of the broker-dealers because it was, you know, it was promoted and um, pushed under the sort of the, the tagline of why buy a stock when you can lease it. So, you know, the, the options industry provided me sort of a viewpoint um, on the lack of knowledge that was, you know, pretty pervasive back at that time regarding options in the financial services, but, you know, pretty much fairly across the whole spectrum of public investing. And, you know, if I could just sort of answer the question with, uh, you know, maybe and one, one last sentence is, you know, why did you join the OIC? I, I feel fortunate that my career has sort of come full circle from being out there, um, you know, in, in on the public stage, you know, preaching, you know, and teaching people the benefits of using options. And OIC provides me that opportunity to sort of provide that, you know, it's an unbiased education with the goal of chipping away at financial illiteracy. So I feel very fortunate, as I know you do as well, to be able to participate on this side of the equation. Indeed, I do. And, um, you know, I'm going to have to have you back on Strategy Spotlight to talk, uh, you know, leap strategies, maybe uh, leaps on MCI, but that, that's for another day. <laughs> um, you know, get, getting back to the, really the OIC, and this is not necessarily meant to be a softball question, but, you know, your insights in terms of do you believe we make a difference? And if so, how? Yeah, you know, that's another excellent question, Joe. And you know the, the the answer to that is, I mean, I can probably just sum that up in one word. Absolutely. Um, you know, the OIC has been around for 26 years. Um, you know, and make no mistake about it, this instrument, you know, this institution has been truly instrumental in the growth of the industry. 
Um, I mean, I can't say much more than that. It's just it, it that. You know, you can. I can look back over the course of my career and the and the various positions that I held and the interaction that I had with OIC, and the amount of seminars that have taken place, the amount you know, and just the evolution, you know, of OIC and um, you know the website and all of the programs that are offered through here. There's very. I can't think of another institution that has um, pushed a specific financial instrument like OIC has. And I think that's a credit to the leadership of the industry for coming up with the concept uh, 20 plus years ago. And, and as you said, I think we all feel privileged to be part of it, to be able to get out there and talk about these dynamite financial tools. Um, I know, I know you've only been with us for a short period of time, but have you had a chance to kind of put your hands around priorities related to retail investors, financial advisors, anything in those areas? You know, I, um, I, to, to be fair, I really don't believe that, you know, the, our priorities have changed. I mean, I, I think that the, you know, the institution oh, I see on it on itself, um, has been, and will always continue to be the, you know, that, um, leading independent voice providing education to global audiences. Um, you know, with that said, and, you know, as you're aware, you know, we are, we're certainly, you know, planning and making, you know, plans to adapt to a more millennial type of approach. And, you know, I know that, you know, we're both sort of excited to see some of the curriculum changes that we're thinking about. But, you know, things have changed over the last 25, 26 years in regards to delivering education. So, you know, with with a 25-year history, 26 years of history, 26 years of, you know, options-related coursework, um, you know, 26 years of interacting with, you know, not only the retail, but with, you know, as you well know, Joe, with brokers and, you know, related entities in the industry. You know, OIC is definitely that focal point industry association um, that will continue to expand its reach. But again, I think the mechanism, you know, on how we go about delivering that education needs to, needs to evolve. Um, you know, it started out with, and I'm sure you were probably involved in a lot of these, you know, it started out with in-person live events. It's evolved into PowerPoint modules and then into webinars and then into podcasts. And, you know, I'm just a believer that OIC is going to need to expand that curriculum into, you know, multi-language e-learning coursework, you know, that evolves with the way that, um, you know, education is evolving, you know, across the globe. Amen. More to come, listeners, on all of that. I, uh, I like that teaser, Paul. Beautiful. <laughs> you know, one thing, you know, we've both been lucky enough to be in the business a long time. Um, you know, options just, to me, get a bad rap about being so darn complicated and risky. Any, any, uh, do you think that's the case or, you know, are you in my camp that, you know, it's, it's really hogwash? <clears throat> well, I mean, I, you know, we've been fortunate enough, um, you know, Joe, you and I, that we've touched a lot of different end users of the product. And yes, we have both heard that probably more often than we want to. Um, you know, my first statement on it is that, you know, I know that options are often viewed that way, uh, and, which is understandable because, you know, the known a lot of times is a little bit stronger than the unknown. And when you have something unknown, people are sort of very quick to put up barriers and, to you know, to be critical of it. You know, however, when you really think about it, you know, there are only two types of options. There's a call and there's a put. And, Joe, you've heard me say this before. You can only do two things with each of those. You can either buy them or sell them. So, you know, if when when people say, oh, it's too complicated, it's too risky, I completely understand that. Um, and and you know what, we're we're sympathetic to it, and that's really one of the best things that the OIC is you know capable of addressing is to getting people's knowledge base to the level where they you know are no longer you know afraid to to implement an option strategy. Now you know with that said, you know knowledge doesn't create wealth by itself, but you can certainly increase the odds for you know, success by increasing your practical knowledge of financial instruments and then doing something with that knowledge. Um, you know, you know, for example, if, 
you know, for selling calls against the stock. It's probably one of the most common examples of using options. And depending on your investment appetite, you know, and that these, these words are probably taken from the ODD, you know, as I'm talking from the back of my memory, you know, depending upon your investment appetite or your risk tolerance, you know, options are alternative tools to reach certain investing goals. And for, you know, for, you know, if you, if, I mean, you want to take baby steps, of course, you know, people should certainly become comfortable with, you know, trading equities. And then the next, you know, the next level of independence is learning about options. But um, I, you know, I do think, Joe, it's a, it's a great question and they often are described and they're, 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 you know, thought of that way. But on the other hand, it doesn't take very much to get up to speed on some very, you know, practical um, uses of options. And if you look at the growth that has occurred in this industry, I think it would be, um, I don't think it's in the best opportunity for people to basically walk away from it without learning at least some of the basics about it. Well, along those lines and, and kind of following up and maybe my last question for you, Paul, I, you know, I believe strongly our mission is to build that base of knowledge to get our listeners and investors to the point where they either have or don't have the confidence to use the product. Any, right, any, right. You know, it, you know, because as you say, we're the beauty of, of, of the OIC is its independence and its ability to be unbiased. So any guidance in terms of helping to get investors to that point of making that you know, informed decision about whether options are for them or not? Well, I mean, Joe, I'm going to try to not do so much of a sales job on this, but, you know, we're both very, very passionate about the OIC. And, you know, I, I feel fortunate. You know, my mother was a school teacher in the Chicago public school system for over 25 years, and my mom has never quite understood what I have done over the last 20 years. But now I have an easy an easy definitive answer that I can tell her. I said, Mom, I, I joined your ranks. I'm a teacher. And you know what? The OIC basically provides that guidance um, for people that are interested in learning or trading options. I mean, you know, you look at, you know, the option seminar instructors, um, you know, they're, they're going to provide a really balanced approach um, when new people are, you know, um, come into the industry and want to learn about the product. Um, you know, OIC has created content that is I'm going to say is beyond comparison of any other resource that's out there. Um, all of the appropriate compliance and um, legal safeguards are in place. It's just a great place, you know, to start with if you want to learn about options. And, you know, I can't say enough about all of the broker dealers and the advisors that are out there that, you know, the general public may use. You know, I think it's important to realize that a lot of those broker dealers um, big wirehouses and advisors, they use our materials. Um, you know, we have a number of partnerships with, you know, uh, quite, a, quite a few industry participants that have realized, um, you know, they don't need to do the, the basic type of education any longer because OIC provides that resource. So it's really just a massive resource that is available um, for free and unbiased um, knowledge base that people can go to. And I mean, if you think I'm missing anything, Joe, please, you chime in here at any moment. But that's how that's how I would address the whole, you know, the whole issue about guidance and for, you know, and for for individuals, you know, deciding if options are something that they might want to pursue. Fantastic, Paul. I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, you know, I really appreciate you taking the time today to uh, really introduce yourself to uh, the listeners of Wide World of Options. Uh, and any closing thoughts before we wrap it up? Well, you know, <laughs> but, uh, I didn't see that one coming, but I tell you what, my last closing thought would basically, I'll put my last plug in for, for our great institution. Um, you know, I'd tell listeners, you know, come visit optionseducation.org. And, um, you know, I think the materials and the resources that we have um, will speak for themselves. Well, uh, Paul, um, you know, we feel very privileged to have you part of the team. Um, look forward to your leadership as we move forward. And thanks so much for joining us today on Wire World of Options Profiles and Perspectives. Thank you very much, Joe. I really appreciate it. Next, 
Let's upgrade your options toolbox with cutting edge trading platforms, devices, and information. Let's talk about tools, resources, and good reads. Let's get right to it for today's tools, resources, and good reads. The tool I'd like to bring to your attention is a website that specializes in options. It's marketchameleon.com. All you need to do is plug it into your browser and immediately you'll see all kinds of stats and details on the options market. Also offered on the site are free customized watch lists. So check out marketchameleon.com. That's M-A-R-K-E-T-C-H-A-M-E-L-E-O-N.com. Now today's resource, and I've mentioned this before, but we've got a new and improved website at the OIC. So you got to check out optionseducation.org. It's been streamlined, updated. We hope you'll like the improvements. And actually, we'd love to hear all your feedback on the site. So please send any comments that you may have on the new website at optionseducation.org. Send that feedback to options at the OCC.com. The new website is found, as I said, in your browser at optionseducation.org. Finally, today's good read is actually one I've mentioned before. It's Jim Cramer's Confessions of a Street Addict. All I can say is it's a book I couldn't put down. It's probably the traitor in me. I just find it to be such an insightful read to what makes the markets tick. That's Jim Cramer's Confessions of a Street Addict. That's it. Thanks for listening for today's Tools, Resources, and Good Reads. Ready for a little nostalgia? It's time to take a look back. In today's Looking Back, I thought it might be a good idea to look at historical monthly returns in the markets, given the volatility we've seen recently. So I want to you know, give a shout out to Yardini Research, the S&P, as well as Harvard Analytics, and I'm taking a look at the S&P 500 monthly returns over the past 90 years. So we're talking about from 1928 to the current 2018. Month returns of the S&P 500 per month are the following. The best return month is July at 1.6%. The worst, and no, it's not October, the worst month for a return in the S&P 500 over those 90 years is September at minus 1%. So on the plus side, December comes in second at plus 1.4%. April's next at plus 1.3%. Then January at plus 1.1%. Five other months come in with positive returns ranging from plus seven-tenths to plus four-tenths percent return over those months. On the negative return side, besides September, which I mentioned comes in at minus 1%, only February and May are the other two months with negative returns in the S&P 500, and both negative returns come in just barely negative at minus one-tenth of 1%. I hope you find these numbers interesting, maybe a bit surprising too. That's today's Looking Back. We love connecting with our listeners. With that in mind, let's take a moment to answer a few questions on OIC's Wide World of Options Q&A segment. It's time for listener questions in today's industry happenings. Saul said asks, pennies, do they help or hurt options? Well, for those of you not sure about the question, Salsit is asking about penny-wide markets in listed options. My answer to this is that penny-wide markets are good for the options markets. The tighter the bid offer spread, the better it is for investors to both buy and sell at the most competitive price, therefore often reducing the cost of both entering and exiting a trade. As many of you know, not all listed options have penny-wide spreads. Wouldn't that be nice? Our next question comes from Lonesome.
how do you manage and define risk within your option trades? Great question, and it speaks to the heart of how and why investors choose to use options, these dynamic financial tools. Could be a long answer, but I'll try to keep it short. You manage and define risk in your option position with the choice of strategy you choose. This is where education comes in. Some strategies involve the underlying and options, some just one option by itself. Other strategies are created with multiple option legs. All of these choices have different risk profiles, every one of them. That's why I said that's where the education comes in. You can use our website, optionseducation.org, as the resource to define your option strategy risks. Generally speaking, long option positions have defined risk, where net short option positions may have substantially more or unlimited risks. The devil's in the details. You can always reach out to our investor services desk at options at the OCC.com with all of your strategy related questions. Last thing on this is as the underlying moves, option strategy risks often change. That's the next risk you need to be aware of and manage. Your appetite for risk will often define how far you want to let your underlying position run. So in addition to optionseducation.org, you'll find excellent risk management tools on your brokerage house websites and some of the option exchange websites as well. Today's last question comes from Galleon. He asks, I need an income trade that produces 7 to 8% per year. What should I be looking for? Well, Galleon, you're asking for income producing type trades, credit trades versus the trades that cost money to initiate or debit trades. Here's a list of income producing trades you may want to investigate. Covered calls, cash secured puts, bear call spreads, bull put spreads, iron condors, and iron butterflies. These are six you'd like maybe to consider. I urge you to use the resources of OIC as well as the brokerage house websites and third party option sites to help you to decide which of these strategies works best for you from both a risk perspective as well as a capital perspective. Thanks for the thoughtful questions today. Keep them coming. That's it for today's industry happenings. You've been listening to the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. If you have questions about anything you've heard on today's show, email Joe Burgoyne at options at the OCC.com or visit optionseducation.org and chat with investor services. Interested in connecting with OIC on social media? Like the OIC page on Facebook. Follow them on Twitter at options underscore edu and Instagram at options education and follow their page on LinkedIn. Thanks for listening and be sure to tune in to the next episode of Wide World of Options. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.